Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another one of your favorite YouTube accounts videos. Your only favorite YouTube account. That's correct. Um, oh, today, no. we are looking at Earth and Environmental Science, one of the, my absolute favorites. Um, I'm not doing it next year, but that's because I know. it's too difficult for me. Yeah. Um, anyways, this video is one of four science videos we have on the year 10 course. Um, the other two were posted a lot earlier in the year, so if you need to know about physics or biology, no, chemistry. Physics or chemistry. Go have a look at those. Um, hopefully I can read your memory before any random exam you have coming up at the end of the year. Yeah. Anyways, let's get into it. Okay, so we're gonna look at, uh, as I just said, every learning objective from this topic. These are just random learning objectives that you may have if you go to a certain school, but for everybody else, it's important as well. Firstly, we're going to describe layered structure of the planet and how it forms. So obviously we've got the layers, so it's the flat base and then just goes up and up and it's up. It's like Lego. Yeah. Uh, so the Earth's structure consists of the following layers. Firstly, the inner core, uh, which is mostly iron, which is solid due to the extreme pressure in the core. Uh, and the temps get up to 7,000 degrees and it's approximately 1,200 kilometers thick. Secondly, uh, the outer core, which is made up of molten iron and nickel. Uh, and the outer core uh, with, uh, has temps of between four and 6,000 degrees and it gets up to about 23 kilometers thick. Did you know the inner core is hotter than the sun? No, I didn't know that. It might not be true, but you're gonna search it up before you post yeah. it again. Um, thirdly, uh, outside the outer core, we have the mantle. Uh, the mantle consists of partially molten rock uh, with temperatures between 500 and 2000 degrees Celsius. Uh, and it's about 2,900 kilometers thick from the top of my head. Um, and the top part of the mantle is where magma comes from. Oh. Um, fourthly, we, four, well, fourthly, we have the crust, which makes up all of what we as humans use and stand on. Uh, it's mostly rigid rock and it varies in thickness from five to 70 kilometers. And there are two other terms that we're going to use here. So firstly, the lith lith lithosphere, which is the 10 interlocking plates uh, that make up the crust uh, that can be between an average thickness of 100 and 300 kilometers thick and float on top of the mantle. Uh, finally, we have the asthenosphere, uh, and this is the magma layer that, uh, that the lithospheric plates uh, that I just mentioned float on, and this can be uh, about 200 kilometers thick. Uh, so further, the creation of the Earth can be sequenced through the lovely table, which I will place here or here or wherever this space on the screen. Uh, essentially, particles clump together to make a body, and through pressure and radioactive decay, a heat was released. Uh, this heat warmed the aforementioned particles, which then moved to the center, forming the core, uh, and then this forced the lighter particles out, which then cooled to form the mantle and crust. Our next objective today is to explain how heat flow and density cause convection currents. Uh, so heat flow and, and density uh, cause convection currents due to the patterns in movement. Uh, so as material re uh, reaches a source of heat, it warms up, making it less dense and causing it to rise and move away from that, that heat source. As the material is now away from that heat source, it cools, increasing its density and causing it to fall down again. This material then moves back towards the heat source, is warmed, rises up, cools and falls back down. So we have a nice cyclical pattern here. Next, we are going to talk about outlining the transition from Pangaea to the modern continents. Uh, Pangaea emerged as a supercontinent in which all land on Earth was joined in one continent through continental drift, which was one of Wegener's thick. Wegener's or Wegener's? Wegener. Yeah. Uh, through continental drift, which was Wegener's theory, the continents have emerged as they are today. Uh, as convection currents occur uh, in the asthenosphere, the supercontinent firstly broke into two, Gondwana and Laurasia, mm -hmm. uh, and then over, time, over more time, they broke up into the continents we have today. All right, next we are going to explain the features and processes associated with divergent, convergent, and transformed plate boundaries. So this is quite a long one. We'll go through each of the different types uh, individually, and I'll chuck some nice little images that I have up on the screen. Um, so firstly, we have subduction. It is a subduction one, which is an ocean and a continent going into each other. So the characteristics of this is that we see there's trenches, volcanoes, and mountains where the plate boundary is, and then the oceanic plate is subducted, which means moves under the continental plate and is sucked back into the mantle. This causes rises in the continental plate, which is then hence the mountains and volcanoes. And the image should have been up on the screen. Uh, next we have, again, subduction, but this time it's between two oceanic plates. Um, so again, characteristics, uh, one of the oceanic plates are, is subducted under the other plate, uh, causing a deep ocean trench on the boundary. Uh, further, when subducted, the plate will melt uh, because of the extreme temperatures and where it does, volcanoes will form. Mm, that's due to hot spots. 
in the Earth, actually. Okay, so next we have collision, which is uh, continent to continent. So these are two continental plates hitting each other. So again, one plate is forced under the other, uh, where it then melts back into the mantle. However, where the boundary is, mountain ranges are formed, and the rocks are pushed together and compressed, and form mountains through folding and faulting, as can be seen in the lovely little image there. So now we move on to divergent plate boundaries. Uh, so spring, so firstly we'll look at uh, oceanic and oceanic plates. Um, when they spread, they essentially create a hole in the Earth's crust, uh, and then magma rises up along the boundary, and then when it cools, it forms a ridge, and these are called mid-ocean ridges. Um, uh, there are characteristics specific to diverging plate boundaries, including uh, topogra topographic highs, shallow focus earthquakes, high heat flow, basaltic rock, fissure eruptions on land, Finally, we have transforming plate boundaries, which is when they slide next to each other. So we have, uh, it could either be, um, well, basically it just works the same for either of them. So it could be ocean to continent, or continent to continent, or ocean to ocean, and yet that's all of the possible options. So uh, these boundaries cause a significant number of shallow focused earthquakes, uh, as the high levels of friction between the plates are then uh, released when they move, um, and the plates slip, which then obviously yeah, causes these earthquakes. Uh, further characteristics uh, of these boundaries include high levels of heat. Um, so now we move on to the next learning objective, uh, which is about explaining the cause of earthquakes, uh, which is you know partly related to what we were talking about before, but this is a more specific analysis of that. Mm -hmm. um, so an earthquake occurs when two plates at a transformative plate boundary slip past each other. Uh, the two plates moving past each other cause a significant amount of friction because the rocks are very rigid, they're like um, rocky, the rocks are rocky. Mm. That is a true statement. Um, and it's not just a smooth slide. Um, and with the amount of friction and the with the amount of friction they create as they move, uh, when the plates slip, uh, that is all suddenly released, and that causes an earthquake. And the next one today is to distinguish between a fo the focus and an epicenter. So the focus is the point under the ground where the physical earthquake actually occurs from, whereas the epicenter is the point directly above the earth uh, above that point on the Earth's surface. So if you can imagine, if you are underground, uh, the point where the earthquake actually happens is uh, the focus. But then if you draw a line straight up. That would then be the epicenter. Uh, now we'll talk about uh, technology that's used for earthquake detection and measurement. So firstly, there's a seismometer. Yeah. Uh, this machine functions by attaching a pen to a string, which constantly draws a line on a page. As the earth shakes, the pen moves up and down, which measures the amplitude, which measures the amplitude of the quake, which is colloquial for earthquake. Yeah. Um, the readings recorded on the paper is called a seismograph. So next we have uh, the two scales for earthquakes. So there are two scales used for measuring uh, earthquakes. These being time and amplitude. So this showing uh, obviously the size of the earthquake and then also how far away it is. So a scale can be built uh, from these and through triangulation, uh, the epicenter can be estimated. Um, so the next learning objective is comparing primary, secondary and surface seismic waves. So there are three types of waves and this table shows the characteristics of each. So we've got primary waves or P waves. Uh, these are the body wave and they travel through the center of the earth. Um, they're longitudinal. They're longitudinal. Longitudinal? Longitudinal. They're longitudinal. Um, and the movement of the particles is parallel to the direction of the movement of the wave. Um, they're able to travel through solid and molten rock and they are the fastest type of wave. Then we have S waves, which are the secondary waves. Um, these again are body waves and they move through the body of the earth. Um, however, these are transversal waves, meaning the particles move perpendicular to the direction of the wave. Uh, if the waves move left to right, the particle moves up and down. Um, however, S waves can only move, so, uh, can only move through solid rock layers, um, meaning they can't penetrate the outer core, having to divert around them, slowing them down, making them the second fastest. And finally, we have L waves, known as love waves, or... Uh, Just love waves, yeah. Or surface waves. Well, no, they, they are surface waves. And then there's love waves. Um, these travel along the surface of the Earth and don't really move through the Earth's body. These are again transversal waves, so just to plow what I said before, uh, and they are only able to travel through air, making them a surface wave. Uh, and they are the slowest type of wave, which actually makes them the most destructive. Okay, so the next thing that we're going to look at is explaining the cause of a tsunami and uh, the technology for detection of tsunamis. So firstly, I'll look at the causes of a tsunami. So tsunamis are essentially created by an underwater earthquake and take place in the order below. So I have, again, a nice little image here, which has some little numbers and that will explain the steps. So step one, and, and uh, as we can see, an underwater earthquake displaces the ocean. Step two, very long, shallow waves travel fast in all directions away from the epicenter. Three, as the waves reach the coast, uh, the gradual decrease um, 
in, in depth uh, of, of the sand, obviously, because you're getting closer to the coast, uh, causes these waves to grow in height and essentially bunch up. Uh, finally, large surging waves reach the shore and cause destruction. Um, so now we'll look at technology for tsunamis. So there are two technologies, two technologies that are used to warn that you can't. There are two technologies that. There are two technologies that are used to warn that tsunamis will occur, and these are the same as seismographs as before, which will show when and where an earthquake has occurred, and the use of DART or DART boys. Uh, DART boys detect changes in the amplitude or height of waves uh, that pass them in the ocean, and then they can detect and relay a warning to important locations as to where the tsunami is. Okay, so our next outcome here is to describe the features and formation of different types of volcanoes. This is a nice one. I think I worked on this all last night. So there are a few different, <laughs> few different types. Actually, no, it was Tuesday night. Uh, there are a few different types of volcanoes. Uh, we're going to run through them all each individually. So firstly, we have composite volcanoes. So the characteristics here uh, is that they're the most dangerous types of volcanoes on the planet. They occur during oceanic to oceanic or uh, oceanic to continental boundaries where subduction zones are present. Thirdly, uh, they are made from a buildup of different layers of ash and felsic uh, rock um, and are typically, uh, and the vis viscosity of lava means that the eruptions can typically be largely explosive. The lava that escapes from the volcano can't make it far down the sides of the vol volcano by, uh, before solidifying, which causes the volcano's steep slopes. Uh, for, uh, second, second lastly, these eruptions are so violent that they often uh, result in the expulsion of volcanic bombs, uh, which uh, is the term for solid pieces of magma which are expelled from volcanoes. Finally, these volcanoes are built as layers of ash and magma solidified on the sides of the volcano, and they are also called stratovolcanoes, as strata or strato means layers, thus the layers of rock. Um, so fortunately, Jeremy is left on a bathroom break, um, unpaid break, of course. Um, I have been instructed to continue filming the video, but I think we'll stop there for a second and just take just take a few seconds, a minute, to just reflect on how much better these videos are when Jeremy isn't here. Um, you know, if you had a look at the Macbeth Act 5 video, where we uh, recently received some really positive comments. Um, well, actually, I received positive comments, but unfortunately, Jeremy didn't. Um, you know that this would be a lovely break from his loud, annoying voice. Although, to be fair, you probably don't need to see the comment to know that. Um, you can probably just hear from the absence of of that, that this is a much safer space to be in. Anyways, let's get back to the reason you're all here. So secondly, we've got shield, volca shield volcanoes. So shield volcanoes are named for their shape. They aren't very steep, but instead a more rounded dome-shaped mountain. Um, however, they're still very large in size. Um, they are caused by interpolate hotspots, as opposed to being at a plate boundary, as the magma at the hotspot rises up through the crust and cools forming rock. Um, these volcanoes are formed by a number of layers, usually um, of the same composition, solidifying over time as more and more magma builds up. Um, as the magma is a lot thinner and more liquid, uh, liquid-esque, Jeremy's written, than in a stratovolcano, it runs a lot better and the eruptions are far less explosive. The lava is able to flow on the surface, um, though it can also destroy vegetation and structures on land. Uh, the third type of volcano we have is cinder cones. Uh, they are the most common type of volcano and have a rounded cone shape. Um, they rarely reach above heights of 300 meters, um, but they have very steep sides. The cones grow rapidly, usually emerging from just one eruption cycle, um, and they are composed of small fragments of rocks such as pumice, uh, which get compacted on top of each other. Uh, when they erupt, the lava doesn't fall far from where the vent is, uh, which allows it to put up on the sides of the volcano, adding to that steepness in shape. The final uh, formation, the final structure of a volcano is a caldera. A uh, caldera is a structure present when an existing volcano collapses uh, in and of itself after an eruption, as the magma chamber in the volcano has just emptied itself. When the volcano erupt, uh, when the volcano collapses, uh, it falls into that chamber. So, the, so there are three types. Firstly, there is the uh, crater lake caldera, uh, and this is when stratovolcanoes volcanoes collapses in a, in on itself. Uh, secondly, a basalt basaltic calderas are, and these have a series of concentric basaltic rings due to the effects of several volcanic uh, collapses over time, and they are often found at the base of shield volcanoes. And finally, there are resurgent calderas, uh, and these are as a result of giant catastrophic eruptions. Yellowstone caldera, which is sometimes called a supervolcano, uh, which is an example. I've heard a knock on the door, so our quiet time is over, but I hope you enjoyed, and let us know in the comments if you did. 
So our next objective here is a nice short one. Actually, we have two short ones in a row. Firstly, we have to distinguish between magma and lava. So magma is the term used to refer to the modern rock, which is inside volcanoes, or basically under the Earth's crust, and when it's still underground. Uh, whereas lava describes the magma when it comes out of, these, uh, of the ground and moves above the surface. Uh, next, another short one, as Jeremy said, we will now appreciate the length uh, of the geological time scale. Yeah. It's great. I, I love it. I absolutely love it. Yeah. Um, in more technical terms, the geological time scale spans about 4.5 billion years. Uh, it covers all major changes and events in the Earth's history. Specifically, uh, the most notable, I think, is the creation of Ben Levy Tudors. Yeah. Not long ago, but still the biggest yeah. event on that scale. 20 BC. 20 BC, yeah. Still only a 200 subscribers, though. Anyway. Uh, 300. 300 almost. Uh, next, we've got to define fossils uh, and give examples of a range of fossil types, which I'll now do. That's quite fun. Um, so, fossils, uh, firstly, the definition of fossils. So, they're any evidence of past life in the forms of remains or an imprint uh, that has been preserved in rock or another uh, substance. And so, there are several types of fossils, uh, and the names of features of them are in the lovely table that I'll put up on the side here. Might be here, might have to be over Luke's face. I don't know. Uh, okay, so firstly, we'll do two of these each, Luke. That's just fast. That's, that's no, five. That's five. five. Okay. So firstly is the uh, petrification fossil. Uh, so this is where the original material is hardened by minerals which are deposited uh, by groundwater, and it can also be called petrification. So it leaves a mixture of the original matter and a new material. Uh, next we have the internal mould. So an internal mould is formed when sediments or minerals fill the internal cavity of organisms, such as the inside of a snail. So this is filling up, the filling up of a shell by minerals, and then obviously when the original shell decays uh, and, and moves away, then you just have the minerals that were inside. Uh, next, uh, next we have an external mould, and this is the shape left in the ground or cave or whatever where the fossil was found. So they take the fossil out and there's uh, an imprint of where uh, everything else has formed around that. Uh, and next we have a cast. So if an external mold layer is filled with another layer of sediment, a cast fossil is formed. Uh, the cast is pretty much a 3D version of the external mold imprint. Yeah. Finally, we have a carbonization fossil. Uh, these are often indicated by a shiny black texture uh, of an organism, and it's made when the organism is carbonized. Yeah, uh, so this is um, similar to uh, like when something would be turned into coal almost, but not exactly. Uh, next, we have trace fossils. So trace fossils are the remains of trackways, eggs, burrows, nests, uh, droppings, or any other type of impression. So fossilized droppings are also called uh, uh, coprolites, and can give an insight into the feeding behavior of animals, which is very important to scientists. Uh, next, we have fossil resin, or also known as amber. Um, this is what they used in Jurassic Park, I believe, yep. to bring back the dinosaurs. Yep. Um, this is a type of resin which is formed when tree sap hardens, uh, and this can often trap insects and fossilize them in like, a, pretty much, it's like a gem. Um, and anyway, finally, uh, we've got body fossils. So these are when whole bodies have been preserved, uh, including things like skin, hair, and muscles, or even a complete skeleton in tar. Um, and these are extremely valuable these are extremely valuable uh, and allow DNA investigation to let us learn more about these beautiful creatures. That's why Luke has stolen many of them from like National History Museums. Okay, next we have to describe the process of fossilization. So fossilization occurs in four main stages and uh, I maybe have a photo, maybe also don't have a photo that I'll put up. Um, but firstly, we have death and rapid burial. Uh, this is where the animal dies uh, and it quickly falls to either the bottom of the ocean or a low point uh, on the Earth's surface and is quickly covered by sediments uh, like sand, which then prevent it from being eaten or just anything else from happening to it. And so here we see that the soft parts of the animal decay and rot away, leaving just some sort of shell or an exoskeleton. Secondly, we have mineral replacement, which is where more and more sediments cover and squeeze into the, uh, the shell into position. Uh, and they may either remain or be replaced uh, with minerals such as limestone and quartz, which would seep into the shell as the original shell dissolves. Uh, thirdly we have the uplift uh, of rock layers so after millions of years and changes in the positioning of the earth's surface movements may cause the sedimentary layer um, containing the fossil to rise to the surface and finally we have erosion exposing the fossil so when weathering and erosion on the earth's surface occur uh, this then allows the fossils to be exposed and the sedimentary rock is eroded yep that's that one our next learning objective is to understand the general progression of life shown in the fossil record do you understand i understand i understand it as well okay that's enough no no but um okay so the fossil record generally shows a uh, the process of life shifting from simple to more complex uh whilst substantial uh, is not a complete evolutionary history as we see that this record favors uh, particular organisms that are widespread throughout the earth and also have hard shells or exoskeletons uh these being the ones that are most likely to actually be fossilized um, next, we will be determining the relative age of fossils. So we'll just get our assistant to bring them up to screen. 
We don't actually have fossils um, officially. Um, obviously, I do in my collection at home. Mm. Uh, this is a pretty easy system called relative dating. Um, don't take that in the wrong way. Um, that means we're not focused on working out the exact date of when something lived, instead when it lived relative or compared to when other things lived. So that there are three principles of relative dating, which generally will now take us oh, through. I will take us through. There's a lot of experience with relative, <laughs> relative dating. dating yeah. So principle number one is the principle of superposition. So this is the idea that layers occur in a particular order, with the oldest being at the bottom and the newest being at the top. Uh, secondly, we have the pr uh, principle of horizontality, uh, which says that all layers are laid horizontally uh, and when placed next to each other, although they can sometimes tilt, um, based on the Earth's movement, they would continue through. Uh, and then finally, we have the principle of lateral continuity. Uh, so this is the idea that these layers uh, continually extend uh, um, sideways just by any gaps in the rock. Uh, for example, if you have a basalt layer on one side and then a massive ravine, uh, if you look at the same height on the other side, there will also be a basalt layer. Um, now we'll move on to comparing the ideas of Lamarck and also Darwin and, also Darwin and Wallace. Um, so these two had quite different theories for how evolution happened, um, as you can see on the screen. In this lovely table. Um, so essentially, Lamarck said if an acquired characteristic key term there, which is something that can be developed during an individual's lifetime, like having a bone grow back stronger after an injury, if an acquired characteristic is used a lot, it will become stronger, and if it isn't, it will be weakened. The claim is then that the offspring will inherit the characteristic and increase it to leading to the current version of that. Or yeah, Darwin, uh, and actually I have a nice little other photo that I've just been reminded of that I will put up here as well, which has some little Wonderful. drafts, which Wonderful. nicely can um, uh, just contrast them. So Darwin said that the variation within the species means that some uh, giraffes, as you can see in this lovely little photo, naturally had longer necks and some of them naturally had short necks. And so the ones with short necks uh, weren't able to survive because of the all well, the selection pressures and everything, which we'll tell you about in a second. Uh, and so the ones with short necks died off because basically they couldn't get the food, uh, which meant that the ones that sh with short necks couldn't breed. And so if you couldn't breed, they couldn't uh, carry on this um, this characteristic to their offspring. And so the idea was that uh, because only the ones with uh, long necks could breed, they are the only ones um, who are passing on that characteristic. And so all giraffes naturally have long necks. Um, next, we will determine, no. Next, we will define the terms of variation and adaptation. So I guess I'll do adaptation sure. and Jeremy can do the second one. Sounds lovely. Um, so an adaptation is an inherited characteristic which makes an individual better suited to their environment. Organisms will have adaptations to both biotic and abiotic factors. Uh, and this means they can adapt to something like the climate uh, and also other organisms uh, and these adaptions will make them last longer so they can reproduce. Uh, examples in thick fur, uh, sharp claws and teeth in camouflage. Um, there are three types of adaptations. Firstly, they're structural. This relates to any ad adaptations to the physical body of an organism, such as fur. Uh, secondly, there's behavioural, and this uh, is an adaptation in how the animal acts, such as staying in a cool burrow during the day. Uh, and thirdly, physiological, uh, and this is an internal change uh, in which, and this is internal changes which are subconscious, such as the ability to change colour. Uh, it's important to note that three things. Uh, firstly, adaptations don't develop in a single lifetime, it takes several. Uh, secondly, an, an individual can acclimate to an environment to become more used to it, uh, but they cannot adapt to it. Uh, for example, if you move somewhere cold, you can get used to the cold, but you won't adapt by developing blubber. Yep, so next we're going to look at variations. So this is a really nice short one. So this is basically just the uh, difference in physical characteristics of organisms in a certain species. Uh, for example, some giraffes naturally have long necks, uh, and some people and some giraffes naturally have short necks, just like how some humans have naturally longer arms than others. Uh, next, we will use examples to outline the concept of survival of the fittest. Yeah. So this concept of survival of the fittest is that not every organism of a particular species can survive, and therefore those best put for their ecosystem will survive. For example, if you're a deer and you live in a pack of other deer and you get hunted by wolves, the ones that are the fastest at running away, the fittest, will survive. Next, we're going to have a look at how the process of natural selection actually worked. Um, so this is where we see the lovely VESP or V-E-S-P system uh, for evolution by natural selection occurs. So as we can see here, it's a process with four steps. I'm sure we can do two of them. That's a great so idea. firstly, the V is for variation, uh, which I just mentioned uh, is the fact that there must be natural variations in the characteristics in a species. So basically not all of them are identical. Uh, so this is what are the variations essentially. Right. Okay, so the next one here is uh, environmental pressures or selection pressures. So this is the concept that more offspring will be produced uh, than the environment can sustain. 
Uh, and so there is therefore uh, a competition for things like food and shelter. So this step explains what the pressures are, and this could be something like a lack of food. Uh, thirdly, for S, we have survival of the fittest. This is the concept that's just explained that there that as nature doesn't have enough for everyone, the organisms that are best suited to their environment will be the ones who can survive and live long enough to reproduce. Uh, and this is the organisms which will survive. Uh, and finally, for P, we have population. So this is the idea that uh, as animals with specific traits are the ones breeding, the most favorable traits will become more common in the population over generations. Uh, and this, is, this looks at what traits will be passed on into the population. Okay, our second, no, our last learning objective that we're going to look at today is uh, to define species and contrast divergent and convergent evolution. So firstly, uh, species uh, is a group of organisms where the uh, animals in that group can interbreed and their offspring can equally reproduce. Uh, so firstly, convergent evolution. So this is where species that are not closely related develop similar traits independent uh, of each other as a pure result of adapting to a similar environment. Uh, so this is where animals aren't related but end up with similar traits as they found similar ways to adapt to the same environment. Uh, for example, echidnas and anteaters both have developed long noses to eat things like ants. Uh, even though they aren't related, they still have those similar characteristics. Next, we will look at divergent evolution. Uh, so this is where groups come from a certain species and then separate to form separate new species. So they all become different uh, as they have different sets of environmental factors and therefore have adapted differently. The key example here is the Galapagos finches. So this is a group of 13 different types of bird that all came from one ancestor. The idea was that, uh, that once the original um, bird reached the Galapagos Islands, they then diversified, allowing each type to support a different environment that was present there. So our differences there are convergent is two different parent species which branch into each other, developing similar traits based on similar environmental pressures, and divergent is one parent species which branches out into new species, and they develop different traits based on different environmental pressures. That's it. That is it. That is our... I quit. Yes. That is our amazing video on the earth and environmental science topic. Uh, we hope you enjoyed. Um, we, we hope you uh, learnt some things uh, and were able to get some nice information from that. No, just I guess, you know, end of your exam period. So I guess, yes, there was something I wanted to add. Oh. Um, end of your exam period, plenty of videos coming out. Lots of maths coming out. Maybe not on YouTube. Maybe keep, not. Keep an eye on that. Maybe just going to be on... Snapchat. On, on Pinterest. Yeah. Who knows? But yeah, look out for those. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Uh, and goodbye.